Let's see here. So I've got well, phi of phi of c is e two in this case, and alpha prime is e one, beta prime, looks like that. The angle of inclination at d here. So this is. Of, this is beta of C, this is beta of D. Um, so phi of D is this angle up here, whereas phi of C is this angle down here. And um, let's see here. So you have to go back to the earlier picture we had about the exterior angles. And I let's see what am I saying here? I think I'm saying that phi of c is, yeah, is e two, right? Because it's that. If you had the rest of the picture here, oh. it's the, it's the exterior angle sweeping from the alpha curve up to the beta curve. Just a second. Let me draw something on the other board. Turn the light on here for a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. So any, any misunderstanding in this proof, it really just comes from like not having the silly picture you need like right in front of you and like losing track of which one is alpha, beta, gamma. Um, so let me attempt a picture. So is it, it, it's alpha, right? And then beta. And then this is um, minus gamma, right? And then over here is minus delta. And so this is the image of, <clears throat> let's see here, this point is A comma C. <clears throat> this point is B comma C. This point is <clears throat> B comma D, and this point is A comma D. And we're mapping from up, X goes from this rectangle to this two segment, right? That's the, the story here. And <clears throat> at the moment, we are labor lab laboring over the integral over beta, right, which goes from here to there, right? And this angle um, here is what's called the E, is that E2? E2, right? This angle up here is, I think, E3, right? The, on the flip side of things, we have to use the angle of inclination lemma, the integral over um, omega, um, let stupid notes go. Yowzers, Bowsers. Yeah. So I'm trying to find the um, formula we had for the integral of omega ij over the curve over the curve segment. So it's like lemma six, lemma six point two. Said that the integral over 
well, it was stated in a different way, but I'll restate it. Lemma one point, a corollary to it, is the integral over a curve. Let me call it gam oh, okay, okay. Ah, words, alpha of omega one two is equal to, well, um, we could write it phi of a minus phi of b plus the integral over alpha kappa geodesic curvature uh, ds. All right. Now, so when we're integrating over, so this is, this, this curve alpha, it's going from AB, you know, up to the surface, okay? That's the result we're using. Um, the question is, what's phi? How is phi defined? Phi is the angle function from E1 to alpha prime. Phi sweeps from E1 to alpha prime. It's that, that's how we define phi. All right. Now, E1 in this is xu. For us, E1 is equal to 1 over the square root of E um, xu, where E is the warping function. So we have to think about what, what, what is xu in each case. Let me draw xu in each case. All right. xu, um, I'll make it brown. Uh, xu, it's, this is xu. Up here, this is xu. Over here, this is xu. Over here, this is xu. And so phi, let me draw phi at each one of these. Phi, um, it depends on which side we are on it, right? Like, because, um, so like phi on this side, phi is, is like that, right? For alpha, phi is sweep down here, but for the minus delta, the phi is up here. Um, because it sweeps from E1, from XU to alpha prime. So like, um, so what I'm trying to say is phi depends on not just the point, but the curve from which we're talking about. So for, at a given vertex, there's more than one phi going around. <laughs> uh, actually, which is probably why I have drawn separate pictures of each vertex to avoid this duplicity. Um, but so like this one right here, focusing on the beta, right? So phi sweeps from E1. So E2 is equal to, you know, phi of, what is this point? Well, this point is, uh, yeah, so V is, yeah, phi of C, right? E2 is phi of C. And over here, let's see here, at the end of beta, like that, right? That's beta prime. It's got a, uh, ah, it's, it's down here, right? So up here, phi uh, bu, 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 d is what? It's pi minus e3, isn't it? which is hopefully what I have written over here. Yes, phi of d is pi minus e3. And so there you go. The integral over beta is the integral over the integral of the, of the geodesic curvature over this curve segment plus e2 plus e3 minus pi. Can we turn off the lights? I'm going to I'm going to go back to All right, so we, 
two vertices down, two to go, right? Three, when you come into, you know, the third, well, I say two vertices, I mean two segments down, two segments to go. So the integral along gamma, right? Well, phi of A minus phi of B. But, um, well, it's, it's different though, because it's, it's at these two vertices, not those two. And so the um, <clears throat> angle of inclination and the um, angle, of this, angle inclination here is zero. Angle inclination there is zero because, again, this is the, the curve segment. Like you said, just like alpha, the, um, the velocity field is the E1 field rescaled. Um, and so, yeah, we just get the A minus VB equal. So literally the integral of the Gaussian, uh, the, I keep saying Gaussian, but I mean geodesic curvature is equal to the 1, 2 form over gamma. And then now 4 is interesting. Yeah, hopefully. So, yeah, so if you can see it, we, um, yeah, so this is the delta curve. So it should be like phi of, phi of C minus phi of D, I guess. Yeah, phi of C minus phi of D plus the integral of the geodesic curvature. But here, phi of C is the, let's see, which one is which, is which? Can you hit the light again? We're on the delta now, right? Uh, yeah, like this is, let's see, so we're on, I'm, I'm doing it for delta, right? So yeah. delta goes the opposite. So this is um, delta prime of, um, of C, right? And um, so the angle of inclination sweeps what? From XU to, so this is, that's that's phi of c, right? Yeah. And so yeah, that's not that that's the interior, isn't it? Yeah. Which but we want the exterior, so that's pi minus uh, pi minus um, what was the numeration? The e one? Yeah, it's e one. That's one. This is one. That's two. Yeah. So that's phi of c. Now up here, this is delta prime of d, right? And so, so, just, so that, that, yeah, yeah, I think phi of D, phi of D is equal to E4. So it's an alternate interior, right? Because E4 is technically pointing down. Yeah, yeah. And so, interrupt light again. Thanks. Yeah. We were just suffering through the fourth vertex, I mean the fourth segment. And we have come to the conclusion that phi of C was pi minus E1 and that phi of D was equal to E4. So there we go, pi minus E1 minus E4. So you get pi from one, pi from the other, and all together, and the, the two angles from the one and the two angles from the other, and um, all together, that's the Gauss-Bonnet angle theorem. Right? So there it is. All right. Now, if that's all there was, it wouldn't really be that interesting a theorem. Where this theorem becomes interesting is when you marry it to, to topological results which have been known since the time of Euler. All right. So um, there's something called the Euler characteristic for a surface that we can calculate. It's a top. Hmm? 
Have we what? Have we talked about it here? I don't think so, no. Not yet. Um, now, so in this, um, in O'Neill, most things are done through what you might call a rectangularization. And so what that is, is breaking your surface up into a union um, of sort of edge joined two segments. Um, so like here's a, a, a picture of a rectangularization of the torus. Um, the reason there's a door on the torus, it goes back to some sort of inside joke with students I had this semester. I have since forgotten the significance of the door, but it was, they were arguing about a door, so I just put a door on the picture to like sort of bring up the argument again because it was some sort of stupid argument amongst roommates, which amused me. So don't read too much into the door is all I'm saying. <laughs> Overanalyze the door. Um, anyway, here's the theorem. Every compact surface has a rectangular decomposition. Uh, the proof he gives in O'Neill is by scissors, <laughs> page 369. Now, there's a difference between um, topology and differential geometry. Topology is concerned with um, what are called homeomorphisms. Homeomorphisms are mappings which are one to one onto and continuous with continuous inverse. But there's no, no, no discussion of differentiation and all that, all right? So the notion of homeomorphism is much more flexible, let's say, than diffeomorphism. Um, diffeomorphism means bijection that's smooth, it's a smooth map with smooth inverse. So, yeah? Yeah, I think if, if it is a diffeomorphism, it implies it's a homeomorphism, but the converse is not true because you could have a homeomorphism which was not differentiable. Yeah. However, the following is surprising. In dimension two, M is homeomorphic to N if and only if M and N are diffeomorphic. Um, and let's see why that is. Now, 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 in truth, I wouldn't be too surprised if my claim has to be qualified a little bit. Like, I'm not entirely sure this claim is universally right. It might be that I need to say in dimension two with certain conditions. I haven't thought that carefully about it. So, you know, if somebody wants to make a comment on this YouTube video that I'll post eventually and, you know, make that statement more precise, that'd be great. But let me show you why it's let me show you why it's true for a large class of surfaces. All right, here we go. So, theorem, if we have a rectangular decomposition of a surface, um, a compact surface, that, that may be the thing I need. I may, I may need to add compact to that for that, that um, connection to be made, all right? Um, but compact just means that, there, that it's basically, you can, you can find for every open covering of the space, there's a finite subcovering. This is what finite uh, compact means. But, um, but essentially, what compact gives you is that there exists a finite rectangularization of the surface. All right, and um, with respect to that finite rectangular decomposition of the surface, you can let v, e, and f be the number of vertices, edges, and faces. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. The Euler character should tell you whether they can be the same or fall off equally. Yes, we'll, we'll see. Um, well, we'll say more about that, but, but that's kind of it. But no, Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, Euler has been dead for a while, and uh, so this is a somewhat old idea. Um, but the point here is that this integer v minus e plus f is the same for all such decompositions. Moreover, this integer is called the Euler characteristic, or chi. Chi of m is v minus e plus f. Proof is given in topology, but 
Um, in fact, it equally is well true for all polygonal decompositions. Um, if I can find Lee's text, I'll make you, or I'll, if I can find the uh, handout from Lee's text, I'll post it in course content for you guys. Yeah, this is a big point in topology, right? Um, yeah, it depends on the topology course. Like it may or may not get covered in a regular first course in topology, but um, this idea is still like. Oftentimes you hear people talk about a triangularization of a space. So it's like finding a set of curved triangles which covers the space. It's essentially images of triangles that you can paste together and they're joined on edges and they fill out the space that's a triangularization. Um, so we talked about rectangularization because it fits nicely with our, our everything else we've done. All right, but... Um, He's cut it in half to make triangles. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but I have a, there, this, um, I believe it's John Lee. John Lee's text on Ramanian manifolds has a really nice about five pages on this that if you're interested in some of the technical details I can share with you. But anyway, so here's a, just, let's make this less, um, this is what you're just talking about. So, uh, triangularization of the sphere is given by a tetrahedron because essentially you can imagine just kind of taking this and blowing it up to the sphere that's the that's the triangularization um, or you could imagine taking this rectangle you could also imagine blowing that up to get the sphere so this is a rectangularization of the sphere in fact that's a triangularization of the sphere um, and, well, in this case, how many vertices do you have? One, two, three, four. How many edges do you got? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? How many faces? One face, two face, three face, four face. How about this one? Eight vertices, 12 edges, six faces. But isn't that cool? It, the Euler characteristic for both of these works out to two. Because these, in fact, are homeomorphic. But more to the point, the sphere has Euler characteristic too. Because, well, this is the thing. Any rectangularization or any triangularization of the sphere, they're all going to have the same Euler characteristic. So we can describe the kind of surface a sphere is by its Euler characteristic being two. Well, that's a good question. The torus, um, in fact, has Euler characteristic zero. Um, and Do you want me to try to do it? Well, I mean, Taurus, right? If you could just like I did it with rectangles. four rectangles. So okay, so you, you're just trying to like basically cut it like here and here and there and there. And yeah, I think I got You want to turn the light on again? Thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Now the thing about these, right, is that they have to be like, like this is that, this is that, this is that, this is that. 
because they're, they're <laughs> closed back up on each other. I'm saying that if we had these four faces, mm -hmm. um, that there's just one edge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's four edge, four faces, four edges, and yeah, four faces, four edges, and these are the same points, also, right? What I'm trying to say is these are the. Like if I'm if I'm assuming that the cut point is the top circle, then these points are these points when in the curved version. Yeah, if I'm if I'm not wrong, and there I've gotten wrong on this before, so. <laughs> How many edges? One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight edges. How many vertices? One, two, three, four. How many faces? Four. Four in my current. So what is the Euler characteristic? <laughs> Why am I doing that? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm supposed to do V minus E plus F, right? Yes. So that's 4 minus 8 plus 4, 0. Woohoo! Euler characteristic of torus. How do you get that? Wait, what? Uh, you did about one by one? So what I, what I did was I, I took four rectangles, yeah. which, so they, they, First of all, the rectangle only has, there's many, uh, many edges which are shared. So I'm taking that rectangle and I'm just looping it back up. So I'm, I'm thinking of the join point being the top circle of the torus. So for example, this right here, would be like, I don't know, this one. Oh, why didn't I try to count them in 3D? Because it never goes well for me. Me neither. So I'm just, I'm just taking them and unwrapping them, drawing them flat, and making marks to identify which sides are identified. Like all of these, these points, are I, these are the same point yeah. and in fact this and that are also like I don't know I need more symbols Pac-Man Pac-Man I mean that's the same it's stupid anyway yes the Euler characteristic of the torus is zero um, I have gotten non-zero many times before this is like the first time I've ever calculated it's gone out to zero for me. I am horrible at combinatorics. I am notorious for double counting or not forgetting to, you know, um, forgetting to count something. Now, one of the things about other characteristic is there's like a pretty nice, um, what's the word? Arithmetic for it, if you will. Um, you can... Thank you. Uh, you can you can count if you take a surface and you glue a donut onto it like that. It modifies the Euler characteristic in a in a pretty well defined way. Um, so the M prime. Let's see here. Which one is which? I think that's M prime. And this is, no, that's M, this is, wait a minute, no, that's M prime. So if you take M prime and you pull the, actually you rip this donut off of it, what happens is you reduce the Euler characteristic by two.
because it's not additive like that. It involves how it's pasted together. Is wise. Let's see here. If only I were that wise. Let's see here. Do do do. I really need to bring some snack food here. Just drinking a Coke without like anything else. It's not good. <laughs> so if M is compact connected orientable surface, there's a unique integer H such that M is diffeomorphic to a sphere with H handles attack, attached. Hmm. So this is a theorem. Another theorem, another corollary. A compact orientable surface M and N have the same Euler characteristic if and only if they're diffeomorphic. So proof if the Euler characteristics are equal, then M and N have the same number of handles. And by theorem 6.8, they're diffeomorphic. All right. So. Let's see here. Oh. So. I basically just read theorem 6.8 and, and corollary 6.9. They say that, um, in short, if M is a compact connected orientable surface, there's a unique integer H such that M is diffeomorphic to a sphere with H handles attached. So that's kind of, a, kind of an interesting result. But, um, and then th corollary 6.9, if you have two compact orientable surfaces, M and N, they have the same Euler characteristic if and only if they're diffeomorphic, which is, well, again, a straightforward consequence of Theorem 6.8, because if the core, if the um, early characteristics are equal, then you can think of M and N as being up the diffeomorphism sphere with H handles attached. Um, and finally, so here we go. Come on, Gauss Bonnet. The total Gaussian curvature M of a compact orientable geometric surface is two pi times its Euler characteristic. Yeah. So, for example, what was the total curvature of a torus? Do you remember? Zero. It was zero. Because it had positive on the outside, it had negative on the inside. Yeah. Or, for the flat torus, you could just integrate zero over the torus, get zero. So, Apparently, no matter how we conspire to put a metric on the torus, it will work out such that either the curvature is zero or it's got a mixture of positive and negative values such that they balance out. Because gauss bonnet theorem says that ultimately the total curvature on a surface is a 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, and the Euler characteristic for the torus is zero. That is a concept independent of the metric. Mm-hmm. So why can't we do the same for the torus? How would we make a curvature? You're saying why can't we put a curvature one? Why and I, we, why can't we make the curvature one over the whole torus? Yeah. Because the Gauss-Binet theorem. Wait, but you can put a curvature one over the 
Uh huh. Yeah, but a plane is not a compact set either. So, plane is a little bit outside the scope of this. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, there's some fussy issues to talk about there, granted. Um, but let's look at the proof of this. So we orient M by an irreform dm. We will let we pick a rectangular decomposition. The rectangles are consistently oriented. Um, so that's a quote unquote oriented paving. Then to get the total curvature, we integrate the Gaussian curvature over each, you know, over each rectangular segment, over each two segment. We apply the Gauss Binet formula to each face of each two segment. And so each two segment we get integral over the boundary of the geodesic curvature minus 2 pi sum of the interior angles. Um, now every face is adjacent with another face, in, in particular the boundary of xi and the boundary of xj. And the way, so this goes back to if you have adjacent faces, right? Think about two adjacent faces. The one has an edge going this way, the other one has to have an edge going that way if they're consistently oriented. Because if they're both like counterclockwise, whatever counterclockwise looks like for us, um, if they're both like this, so it's coming down from this, it's going up on this. All right, so the, the adjacent faces have to be, they're the same point set, but they're oppositely oriented. So the integrals of the geodesic curvature on the matching faces have to vanish because they're equal and opposite integrals. Um, and um, so all the integrals over the um, geodesic curvatures of the interior boundaries cancel. And um, Furthermore, the sum of the interior angles is 2 pi at each of the v vertices, right? Think about this. At any of the, at any of the places where you have faces joining, the sum of all of the interior angles has to be 2 pi, right? Because you go all the way around. Um, thus, the integral of the Gaussian curvature over m well, the geodesic curvature piece gives us zero, and we get minus 2 pi. Um, plus that. Let's see here. So I get minus 2 pi f. Where's that f coming from? Why is it minus 2 pi f? Sum i equals 1 to f, right? Sum is over f. We have, we're adding 2 pi, minus 2 pi to itself f times. So minus 2 pi f is what this term gives us. On the other hand, we're looking at the sum i equals 1 to f of the interior angles of the i-th face. Um, and that is, I, I, I claim that that is 2 pi v. Let's see here. Sum at, oh, at each vertex you get 2 pi. So I, I think this going from here to there, maybe it would help if I just made a picture. Can we turn the light on? Let me, let me try to make a picture for that one. Thanks. Um, it does. Boop, boop, boop. All right, so like
there, that, that, that ought to be enough. Suppose this is a picture of the um, rectangularization of the surface, right? Um, the claim is that the sum over the interior angles of the ith face Well, it's I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4, right? Ah, golly. Ah. I'm going to have to do something about these boards before the fall. I'll tell you that right now. This is not going to work. Um. All right, so like to be more annoying, the interior angles, there's like, let's say I1, I1, 1, I2, 1, I3, 1, I4, 1, that's for the first face. If this is phase two, you've got I12, um, one, I22, two, two, I32, uh, I42. I'm using upper indices to indicate like phase two, phase three, right? You got like I13. I two three, I three three, I three four. Excuse me, I other way around. Right. You see how this goes? So like the fourth face, we've got I one four, I two four, I three four, I four four. For the fifth face, we've got I15, I25, I35, I45. I'm starting to be very happy that I didn't draw any additional faces. <laughs> so what is the sum of the interior angles? Uh, 360 times 5. 360 times 5. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right for this one, but the point is... How many vertices do we have? I guess for this to be, for this to be compact, some of these have to like, oh man, I guess this doesn't even make curses. I don't know if this is even possible. <sighs> you know? Because I should have, I should have done, I should have actually done a, um, like a rectangularization of an actual shape. This is, might not be a possible rectangularization of a compact surface because I have to like, <sighs> to come back. I got five faces, but I'm supposed to have two pi, two pi v. V is the number of vertices. How many? All right. How many vertices do I have? I got one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it still work out because that would be five. That would be two pi times five, and that would be ten times pi, and which would give you five pi. Five times two. Yeah, two pi five. Yeah, still work out. Look, f equals five, b equals ten, which would give you five two pi or five root three sixty. F equals ten, 
But it's the, the claim is that this is 2 pi v. That is 2 pi v. Oh, wait, no, no, it's not. It's 2 pi v minus 2 pi f. The sum at each interior vertex is 2 pi v. That's, that's the claim that's made here. Because this is the minus 2 pi f. And then this piece allegedly gives us 2 pi v. If I go back to my torus, for just a second, there were what? One, two, three, four vertices. Yeah. And in that case, the, and that, I mean, in that case, the interior angles were, well, you know, you can see them. There were 16 right angles, right? So for that actual rectangularization of the torus, you could actually see that the sum over the interior angles, right? Yeah. Was equal to 2 pi times the number of vertices, which has happened to be 4 here. Of course, it's also 2 pi times f, because f is equal to v here. Which is not super helpful in that sense, but um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Now he, he claims that four times the number of faces equal to twice times the number of edges. We had eight. We had eight edges in the torus, and we had four faces in the torus rectangularization. That checks. Sixteen equals sixteen. Here's another one with twelve edges, six faces, six vertices. Um, I guess this one, oh, I'm sorry, I should turn off the lights and, yeah. Thanks. I mean, here's another example where the interior angles are 2 pi times the number of vertices, because you got 2 pi for this one, 2 pi for that 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 one. Man, it just seems like it's 2 pi times the number of faces, though, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's okay. Here's a quote from O'Neill. Each face has four edges, but each edge belongs to two faces. Thus, 4F counts each edge twice. 4F equals to 2E. Recall, the Euler characteristic is V minus E plus F, but that is equal to V minus F because... E is what? I mean, E is equal to 2F, right? Yeah. So if we're 2F minus F is just minus F, so V minus F. But V minus F is also what we just worked out. 2 pi V minus F, so that is 2 pi times the other characteristic. And there it is. So up, in, up to my inability to do combinatorics and like simple face counting, edge counting stuff, there's, there's the proof, um, which is really, it's really an astounding result because on the one side you have this topological thing which is just based on the existence of a rectangularization or triangularization or pentagonalization if you want, if you really wanted to, <laughs> or hexagonalization, or <laughs> and, and that agonal, yeah. Um, on, the, on the right hand side we have something that's, that's, that's topological, it's independent of the choice of metric. And on the other side, we've got something which is, you know, based on that metric calculation, that Gaussian curvature. And as I pointed out already, the torus, you know, well, their characteristic zero. Hmm. Oh. Oh, look, we could just use one rectangle for the whole torus. <laughs> Duh. Look at that. Why do we think of that? I don't know. I'm a dummy. No.
<laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Some of those comments they hurt. <laughs> it's only when they're right. Yeah. Well, I mean, my my favorite though is every so often I'll get some comment like, "I'm a professional mathematician for 20 years. This guy doesn't know anything about topology." I'm like, "Okay, fine. That's great. So if you know so much, then what did I do wrong in this lecture?" Because I'd honestly be interested to know what was wrong and, you know, it would be valuable to people who watch my channel if there was like a counterpoint video that said, here's everything wrong with James Cook's blah, 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 lecture on blah. Like that would be a great follow up to my lecture. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on everything. I talk about what I know at the time and I do my best, but I'm well aware that there are people who know more and can make better graphics than I. <laughs> I don't, you have to, your PhD topic has to be something at least some people are at least a little bit interested in. I think your audience, you'd have an audience of, I think you'd have an audience of me for that, so I don't think that's enough. Um, it's more like a dozen people, maybe 20 at least. Okay, I gotta get 20 people. I'll go through all your ex students. Ah. All right, so let me try to. Mm -hmm. Oh, my kids don't care about math. Um, not yet, anyway. Um, let's see here. No, but I would make jokes during the whole paper. Don't worry. Mm. Wow. So, so the... Um, yeah. <laughs> applications of Gauss-Binet theorem. My old lecture 28. Um, we have, as I've mentioned, the flat torus. So that would give you that the Euler characteristic is zero. But on the flip side, the integral of the, uh, you know, the positive negative, the, the, the torus with the um, curvature function, which is inherited from the induced geometry of three dimensions. In other words, sort of the natural concept we started with for curvature, the one that's more married to our usual intuition. Well, there we had the balance of the positive and negative giving us zero. But any metric that you can put on a torus, it's got to work out such that it's got negative and positive curvature because of the Gauss-Binet theorem. All right. Um, if we, let's see here. If we delete a point from the sphere in example 2.41 of chapter 7, we saw that there exists a flat metric for the sphere. This means that the Gaussian curvature was zero as calculated from metric. However, However, ooh, this is, see, this is why I said it was subtle, Audric. Check this out. So, like, yeah, we delete one point from the sphere. One point. And that, deleting that one point gives us the stereographic projection map yeah. to the plane. And we can pull back the flat metric up to the sphere and make it the flat sphere. Keep in mind, it's not the whole sphere. It's minus one point. And that's all it takes to make the difference. See, if it had been on the whole sphere, then we'd be in trouble. <laughs> because then we would have had a contradiction to the Gauss-Binet theorem. See, because we know the Euler characteristic of the sphere is what? It's, it's two. Oh, yeah. so, so that says that the total, the integral, the total curvature should be two pi Euler characteristic, which is four pi. Yeah. We calculated the total cur curvature of the sphere before it was four pi. See, for the whole sphere, like that that one point we're deleting, yeah. It had, it had, yeah uh, well, that we delete, we can delete one point on the sphere and make it curvature zero oh, yeah. for the deleted sphere. But that's not the sphere. Sphere and deleted sphere are different topologically. Well, that makes sense. Like topology, it doesn't care about like you know curve versus corner. But it does care about a point being removed. Yeah, well, if you can, if you can hold a sheet of paper into a sphere, it's different from holding it into like a kind of a cup. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, punchline here: there does not exist a metric on the whole sphere for which the Gaussian curvature is less than or equal to zero. If there was, then we could do the integration of the 
to calculate the total curvature, it would be less than zero, but the Euler characteristic is four pi for the whole sphere. All right. So if a compact orientable geometric surface M has positive curvature, Gaussian curvature, then M is diffeomorphic to a sphere. That's, it, that's not quite right. It's a sphere with, um, I think with handles. Wait a minute, is that right? How do I know? Oh, I mean, there's the proof. So the, 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 um, so this goes back to the theorem that we were glossing over right before you came back, which said that any compact orientable surface is diffeomorphic to a sphere with H handles. And a sphere with H handles has Euler characteristic 2 minus 2 H. So if the, if the Gaussian curvature is positive, that means that 2 pi times the Euler characteristic is positive by the Gauss-Binet theorem. The only way that can happen is if 2 minus 2 H is positive. The only way for 2 minus 2 H to be positive is if H is equal to 0, which is to say that it's a sphere. So this is it. Every compact orientable geometric surface is diffeomorphic to a sphere. Interesting. But also kind of boring. So if you're talking about a compact orientable geometric surface, you're talking about a sphere. Up the diffeomorphism. So you could also be talking about an ellipsoid or all kinds of other stuff, really. So I'm picking summary points of section 7.7, .7, which is basically 376 to 384 of O'Neill. Um, so this is um, the corollary to one of the theorems. Let's see here. Following properties of a compact-oriented surface are equivalent. There exists a non-vanishing vector field on M. The Euler characteristic is a zero. M is diffeomorphic to a torus. So the, um, the Harry Ball theorem says that you can't find a non-vanishing vector field on the sphere, on the entirety of the sphere. But this theorem says that you can find a non-vanishing vector field on the torus. See, that's because, um, well, it's because the torus is not a sphere, <laughs> but in a mode. Um, but here's the, here's the proof anyway. So if you have a, um, <clears throat> if you have a, a global frame on the surface, right, then you can calculate the uh, connection form, d omega 1, 2, minus KDM, and then you can apply the Gauss-Binet theorem, 2 pi XM is equal to the integral of KDM, which is equal to minus the integral of d omega 1, 2, but if this is defined for the whole surface, then you get the integral of omega 1, 2 over the boundary of M, but the thing is, the boundary of M is empty for a compact-oriented surface, so this integral is straight up zero. So it shows you that the Euler characteristic must be zero. The thing stopping you from doing this for other things is the non-existence. Like you can't do, this argument doesn't happen for the sphere because you can't find this for the whole sphere. So you can't prove that the Euler characteristic is zero from the existence of a, you know, well, you don't have the existence of the frame. Now the other direction, um, 